everyone and welcome to the NG Podcast. I'm Marcus Einstein, your host. In the NG Podcast, we hope to bring you content that's of interest to anyone involved in enteral feeding, whether you're a healthcare professional, a patient or a carer. Here we go. Hi everyone, for this week's NG Podcast, we're travelling across the pond to get an insight into how nasogastric tube safety is managed in the USA. Uh, I'm grateful to our guests today, uh, Deanna Vischer and uh, from Denver, Colorado, and Beth Lyman, who is in Kansas City. Welcome to the NG Podcast. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. You are most welcome. You are most welcome. So um, both Beth and Deanna are on the board of uh, Aspen's Novel Project. Um, Aspen is the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, I guess similar to Bear Pen over here uh, in the UK. And the uh, novel is their project to look at new opportunities for verification of enteral tube location and in pediatrics. Uh, it's been a, a, a patient safety campaigner for the last 12 years and is novel's parent, representative and safety advocate. And Beth is chair of the novel project. She's now a consultant, but before her retirement, uh, lucky you, Beth, uh, in uh, 2019, <laughs> she was the co-director of the nutrition support team at the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I know it's considerably earlier where you are than where I am. Uh, Deanna, you, you said you just had seven inches of snow. Yeah, we had uh, seven and a half inches. So I set my kids to go sledding since their school got canceled for a snow day. <laughs> oh, lovely. We're, we're, we're just canceling schools for so many other reasons at the moment. Um, but um, I, think, I think it would be quite good if we got snow and, and it gave the kids something else to do. Although I'm not sure what socially distanced sledging looks like. Um, well, they're all muffled so, um, up with all their um, ski gear, so they're pretty covered. They should be fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, today there's two things I thought would be really interesting uh, to our audience. Firstly, uh, to hear the voice of someone who's experienced the impact of an error in enteral feeding. And secondly, to talk through not just what the guidance is in the UK, for NGT feeding, but also for understanding the journey you're on for improving patient safety and, and also perhaps highlight what you've found successful in, in changing practice and perceptions. So perhaps if we can start with the first of those things by uh, hearing from Deanna about the circumstances that have led you to work in improving patient safety uh, with NGT feeding. Can you talk about what happened to you and your family? Yes. So um, in 2008, I had my middle child, Grant, and we knew going in that he was going to be born with a heart defect. And so within 12 hours of him being delivered, he was transported to a children's hospital in my state where he was um went under observation to determine exactly what kind of heart defect he had. So when he was four days old, he had open heart surgery and um, did very well um, with his surgery. And um, he had what was called coarctation of the aorta. So the valves were not properly um, developed where they were supposed to be. He ended up having a Gore-Tex valve um, replace one of his heart valves and um, he did, like I said, he was doing very well um, during his recovery process. And um, in fact, he was doing so well that eventually in less than a week's time, he was put down into a step down unit from the NICU. And when he was um, on that step down unit, they, um, he was not taking, uh, I, they think because of the medications he was on and still recovering from the open heart surgery, that that might be why he was not um, taking to my breast very well. And so they decided it would be better for him to get his nutrients through an NG tube. And so 
um, the nurse um, proceeded to try to do the NG tube feeding at the bedside. And um, she struggled a bit and told me that um, because she's struggling that she would prefer to do it under x-ray. And so um, we went to x-ray. I held his hand um, while they put the NG tube in and then he started getting his feet um, that way. And um, that was about when he was nine days old. Well, a couple days later, uh, it was a Saturday morning, the nurse that came on shift wasn't comfortable with the style of feeding tube that they put in because he'd also been having some reflux issues. So they did what they called transpleuric. So they put the feeding tube past his stomach so that any mm -hmm. reflux wouldn't go into his esophagus and would just go in his stomach. And, um, and so she thought that he was doing better and didn't need that. So she wanted to put a different style of feeding tube. So she called the doctor, got permission to do a different feeding tube. And so she proceeded to do it at the bedside again, like the previous nurse, she did struggle. And when she was struggling, I told her that the previous nurse had um, difficulty as well and ended up doing it under x-ray. And the nurse um, said, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I'll be able to get it in just fine. So she struggled a bit more, got it in. And then I asked her, you know, since I was there when they were doing it under x-ray and saw how they verified there, I asked her, well, how are you going to know that the feeding tube is placed correctly? And so that's when she proceeded to tell me that she does what's called auscultation where she puts a burst of air in the tube, listens through the stethoscope, and listens for that noise. And, uh, you know, she let me listen to it. And I said, well, how do you know it's really there? I said, couldn't it make that noise elsewhere in the body? And she said, well, then that's why we also do aspirate. That's where they pull fluid out. Um, but she did not check it. She just verified there was fluid in there and said, and told me, this is how you know that it's in the stomach. And then I looked at her and said, well, how do you know that that stomach fluid, aren't we made of mostly water? Couldn't that be somewhere else in his body? She reminded me that she'd been doing this for 20 years and that all things would be fine. I did not know that all these questions that I was asking would foreshadow the events that led later that day because all day long, Grant struggled. Um, his, he was agitated and considering he had just had open heart surgery and was still, you know, in 11 days of recovery, he actually was a, quite a trooper and pretty mellow baby. He didn't really fuss much. The only time he really fussed is when he had his diaper changed. He did not like the cold air. He liked being nice and warm. And so, you know, to see him struggling now and to be fussy um, just seemed out of characteristic for him. And then his coloring started changing and he was blowing bubbles. And so we, you know, called the nurse. And at this point, the nurse that had been in that morning was on break. So it was a different nurse that came in. And then she came in, cleared out the bubbles, checked, you know, his monitors and stuff, and then said, you know, that should help. He'll be doing better. She left. He did do a little bit better, but still his color's off. He's very agitated. Um, this is the first day that um, I've had an opportunity to leave the hospital. So my husband and I um, had my parents come and they visited with our son. And I took a break and went out to lunch with my husband. First day I'd ever left the hospital. And when we came back, my parents um, said, you know, Grant had been doing, you know, very, very agitated and that his pallor was off and that he was blowing bubbles again and said they called the nurse in and the nurse just said he's a fussy baby. And uh, they knew that wasn't true. And uh, so we uh, said our goodbyes to my parents and they left and um, we noticed that Grant's color was very ashen and he was blowing the bubbles a lot more furiously. So we called in the nurse, she came in, and when she came in, um, this was an, um, an evening nurse, so we have a different nurse, and later found out she was an on-call nurse, so not as familiar with the floor and their protocols in that unit, because uh, when she did come in and we told her that he was blowing bubbles, she went and got a ginormous suction and was suctioning his nose, and we were telling her that they'd used a different type of suction and had put it in his mouth, and so she switched that out, and then... Um, she, uh, it was about time for him to have another feed. So 
so she went up and um, it was like she had a to-do list. She was looking at, you know, okay, I've addressed your immediate concern. I've got these things I'm supposed to do um, at this time of day for your child. So I'm going to do that. So she started going through and one of those things was giving him a feed. And as soon as she pushed in that feed, um, he went completely gray. His lips started turning blue. My husband was holding him at that time and, you know, shouted to the nurse that, you know, his lips are blue. So she came running around, took him out of his arms, laid him on the bed, hit the call light um, and asked for a nurse to come in. And the nurse says, well, we'll get your nurse. And then she says, no, I am the nurse. Then she asked me to run out in the hall and ask for help. So I ran out and hollered, you know, please help. My son is turning blue. And then I heard on the PA, they started calling a code blue to our room. And I watched as over 20 people advanced on the room to try to help resuscitate our son. And as they were working him, another nurse came and pulled my husband and I to the side. In the meantime, I'm actually holding my 15 month old son who was with us at the time. And as the nurse is giving us kind of a play by play of what the staff is trying to do to help our son, another nurse takes our 15 month old Mason out of the room. And then we listened and watched as the staff tried to revive him. And I remember just layers and layers of people surrounding this tiny little bed, doing chest compressions and looking in his throat, doing, um, putting one of those tubes down. And uh, I heard a doctor say that they think that um, the feeding tube pierced his trach. And um, then we hear the doctor say that they think they've done everything they can do. And then I pleaded and begged, please try harder. Don't give up now. And then the doctor gave us kind of sad eyes and they continued to work on him. But I think they were just pretending to try to placate two parents that are just in complete disbelief of what just happened. And then they called his death at 9.10 that night. And my husband and I just collapsed to the floor and just sobbed. And I have no idea how long we sat there on the floor, but around us, they started, you know, cleaning up what they had been doing to try to resuscitate him. And then later a nurse helps us get off the floor and sets us down and lets us know that the doctors would like to come in and talk to us and talk about what happened. And that's when the two doctors told us that they believed that the feeding tube that the nurse had put in that morning had pierced his um, throat and had actually gone into his lung and instead of his stomach. So that burst of air I heard that morning was the only other resonant organ in your body, which is your stomach and your lungs. And that fluid she pulled up was not fluid from his stomach. It was fluid from his lungs. And I found out later that if she had used um, a pH strip, that potentially his life would have been saved. They would have caught it sooner. And I'd have a 12-year-old son today instead of the memories of an 11-year-old day baby. Yeah, and I think, thank you so much for, for sharing that with me. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate you recalling them again. It's obviously such a, a vivid memory for you. And I, I'm sure despite speaking about Grant many times um, before, it, it, it doesn't get any easier to do. So, you know, thank you for, uh, for, for doing that for us. Um, for, for anyone listening to the podcast who would like to hear uh, more about Grant's story, there, there's a, a very moving video on, on YouTube uh, produced in conjunction with the patient safety movement in the U.S., uh, where uh, Deanna and uh, Rich, uh, Grant's dad, talk about what happened that day and subsequently. We, we'll put a link to that in the comments section on, on the YouTube uh, channel because I, I think it's really worth, um, especially healthcare professionals who who may have been lucky enough not to, to, to have avoided being in the situation like that. I think it would be of enormous benefit for people to to to, to hear that uh, again and in more detail. Um, so thanks, thanks, for Diana. Um, I, I guess a, a lot of people experiencing 
what you do would probably never want to see a healthcare professional again and certainly not put themselves in the position where they have to revisit the pain more often than, than they would do anyway. Um, but but that's that's not what you did. Um, so um, can, can you tell me how you've taken what happened to Grant um, and used it to try and reduce the risk for other families of children who are um, NG fed? Definitely. So after Grant died, we did work with the hospital um, through a lawsuit to make um, changes because we didn't want anyone else to endure the type of pain we had when we found out that there were other methods that could have been used. So we wanted to make the hospital legally obligated to implement those changes um, because we found out that auscultation and aspirate are actually very outdated procedures even back then in 2008 and that pH strip is really um, the preferred method. And so um, we did that. Um, but then time goes on and um, I ended up having my third son, Liam. And when he very quickly surpassed Grant in age, because Grant did only live 11 days, it really had me thinking a lot more about Grant and what would he be like and um, got me wondering about, did the hospital really make those changes? How do I know that um, they're still doing those changes and what are the results that they have um, discovered as a result of making those changes? So I reached out to the hospital and asked if I could meet with them for them to go over um, the protocols that they put in place and what they've learned from them. And so I met with the risk officer and two nurses that um, had peer reviewed Grant's case. And when they uh, met with me, they um, talked to me about the different issues that they had uncovered. And apparently there were more issues and um, they call it the Swiss cheese effect where there were several layers of things um, that had happened. So um, some of Grant's charts hadn't been updated that supported the things I was telling the nurse that day. Um, apparently it hadn't been recorded that the first um, feeding tube had been done under x-ray. I don't know why she would think I wasn't telling the truth, but anyways, there are just multiple things that had happened. And as a result, um, they made additional changes besides just the feeding tube. But then they told me that um, they learned that by changing their protocols and having pH being, you know, their first line of defense and x-ray being the second, they knew at that time, and this is 2011, that they had already saved at least four babies that they know for sure um, mm -hmm. because of their change in protocol. And um, I thought, wow, four babies, you know, saved as a result of these changes how do I make that number bigger? Four is not enough. I mean, it's a great start. And um, so when I left that meeting, I got to thinking, you know, how can I help more? How can I make change? And so I contacted the hospital again and asked, you know, is there a way that I can be involved with patient safety to make changes? And this was huge because um, when Grant first died, my husband and I could not even drive past the hospital and the hospital was on the way to the airport. And, you know, we've taken several family vacations and we took the long arduous way to get to the airport just because we couldn't even go past the hospital that he died at. And now I'm asking to be a member of that hospital and a volunteer, you know, capacity. Um, but they did, they, um, chief medical officer met with me, um, you know, offsite at a restaurant and asked to, you know, asked to hear my story, talk to me about the different opportunities I could have and let me pick which um, committee I wanted to be on. And so I chose the patient safety committee. And um, so, you know, being a parent voice at the hospital for any type of safety issues, um, but especially those that revolve around NG tubes. And it was through that committee that um, it was shortly after my getting involved with them that they told me that nationally there is a committee that is banding together that wants to um, 
you know, really focus on NG tube placement and would I be interested in being that parent voice? And that is how I met mm. Beth Lyman is, um, you know, she was chairing that committee and collecting, you know, the different members to be those voices around the nation in the U S for us to work together. And, you know, it was during our committee that we picked the name of our, our committee being the novel project and focusing, mm. you know, 100% on, you know, how can we get a gold standard for feeding tubes across the U S and then, you know, later, how can we take this internationally and make this a, a, a change that could be for any country? Um, because yeah. there are so many different countries that still do, you know, outdated practices. Well, you know, I, I still think it's amazing that you have, you know, taken what happened to you and your, and your family and turned it into such a positive thing you know and I know you've already made a big impact and, and I just know that's uh, that's going to continue and it's really interesting you say about the different countries because obviously we we're talking to um, clinicians in a lot of different countries as well and we're still finding a really big uh, variation in practice and um, a lot of places just don't really have any guidelines it's down to the individual clinician so you know the the mission that you have uh, got involved in is is such an important one you, you said about that that's where you met Beth on the novel project and Beth I think there are differences between the UK and the US in in how things are managed um, and, and I know you, you've had some exposure to uh, the people involved in NG safety over here so um, what are the big differences between the, the UK and the US on um, NG placement verification? Well, in um, the UK, I'm probably uh, speaking to the choir here, but you have, because you have the National Health Service, um, you have the advantage of having um, a group that vets a, a patient care issue and the uh, evidence, the best practice evidence that's out there and sets a standard for practice and expects people to follow that. And then they gather data to determine the root cause analysis of sentinel events such as NG tube misplacements once they have set that standard. Um, in the United States, we do not have that. In most, many countries that do not have a national health plan do not have the ability to standardize practice, collect data, consider something a never event. Um, so we are not alone, but we are also not at the level of the United Kingdom. We, each institution is responsible for setting their own policies and procedures. Um, some of those policies and procedures are based on the best evidence, and some of them are based on this is how we've always done it. Um, mm -hmm. We don't think we have a problem here. I've never heard of this happening. Um, we can't afford to do this. We're not going to do point of care testing. Uh, and so uh, there are a number of reasons why in the United States, we don't have a standardized approach to this. And then we also do not have mandated reporting. There's no central mechanism such as the trust that these sentinel events get sent to and um, the data gets looked at by another set of eyes. Uh, we have some states such as Pennsylvania that requires such data to be reported at the state level, but by far and away, most states do not have that and they are not interested in getting it. So we have no central repository. We have no idea um, how many of these tubes are misplaced in the United States. So those are the kind of the big differences and they have tripped us up. And these issues, these events that, or, uh, that are, um, so raw for Deanna and other parents that have gone through it are continuing to happen. Mm. I guess um, while in the UK we often find things, we, we, we have a love love for the NHS, but we also find things that we would all think would be better. One of the great things about it is that there is a national uh, mechanism for creating guidelines, even though each 
uh, each trust is is a separate entity the the the, the guidelines can be enforced and you're quite right that the the reporting is enforced legally so it's really interesting to hear that in the states you, you you've kind of got to go institution by institution and i'd like to come back to that as a point when we, uh, we talk a little later about you know the key things you've learned about uh, how to affect the change back to the number of ngt misplacements one of the things when i watched uh, diana and rich's video um that that i mentioned earlier uh, was the stated incidence of NGT misplacement in children. The, the data in the UK that we often talk about is in adults that on initial placement, between 2 and 4% of tubes are misplaced. I haven't seen good data, which maybe one of the listeners will pull me up on, on, on um, the incidence in children in the UK. Can you tell me about the research Novel have done uh, and what that told you about the risks of NG feeding in the States? Well, we also do not know that numerator. We do not know how many children have misplaced NG tubes. We have data in the NICU that approximately half of NG tubes are misplaced when compared to an X-ray, but most of those are actually in the esophagus or they, the tube is uh, migrated down in through the pleura. So they're not a pulmonary bed as a rule. Um, what we do know is that about one in four children in the United States has an NG, a nasogastric, orogastric, or postpyloric tube, and that two thirds of those children are in a NICU. And so um, the fact that Deanna's son, he's kind of the classic um, case. So the, our most vulnerable, smallest infants are the ones that are at the highest risk of having an NG tube misplacement. And part of it is that it is possible um, to uh, damage tissue, to have an 11 day old or a small infant that uh, doesn't have good tissue integrity in the area of the esophagus and the trachea for one reason or another. Um, so it's possible to, to perforate these um, anatomic uh, positions. Uh, without, uh, you know, standing on the bed and, and, you know, acting like you are using a sledgehammer. Um, now, in um, adults, we don't have that same information, but what I would say is that Aspen now has an adult version of the novel project. I did share that until recently, and now we have a, a nurse, Jan Powers, and a dietitian, Britta Brown, who's chair the adult novel we don't know how many adult patients have an NG tube. Um, we don't know for sure how many get misplaced because the data that we have are estimates and it's in the range of two to 4%, um, depending on how you uh, define a misplacement. If, if it's uh, just not where it should be, the, the percent might be higher. They might also be somewhat in the esophagus. Okay. And, and um... I know in, in, in 2016, um, you um, sent a survey to home care companies. Uh, and I know that the, the way home care is done in the States is a little bit different, but um, what did you find from that in relation to how NGT position is checked in the community? So, <clears throat> excuse me, going back to the the first study we did, the 2015 63 center study, the verification of placement most commonly done was aspiration and auscultation, which Deanna already said are probably the two worst ways you can do it. pH was way down the list. So we were looking at what is going on in the home and of the parents that responded to our survey, the vast majority were using auscultation or aspiration, mostly aspiration to verify NG2 placement, a few were using pH. So what was going on in the institutions was going on at home because people were taught if they were, if, if an institution was using non-evidence-based and frankly inferior methods to verify NG2 placement, they were sending children home with that same method, uh, which is highly, highly unfortunate. Now in uh, this year, we sent out a survey to hospitals and clinicians 
to see if the bar had changed. Have things changed in the last five years since the novel project? And um, we did find uh, of the uh, respondents that we got, we're still mining that data, but we did find that a significant number have now switched to using pH, which um, is very, uh, very encouraging actually. Yeah, yeah, so that, so that, that is fantastic. It just shows you that, uh, that, that it can be done. I'm, I'm sure yes. you will say there is still plenty of work to do, but actually um, it'll be really interesting to see when you've, you've finished uh, looking at that data exactly how far you have managed to uh, change practice. We were talking about the UK and, and as you know, we've, we've had pretty clear uh, guidance on NGT safety since 2005. Um, has, has the UK's work influenced what you've done in the USA at all? Yes, absolutely. Um, Francis Healy, Dr. Francis Healy has had quite an impact on us, uh, particularly me and the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, we look at the patient safety alerts. We look at that resource set that is fantastic, by the way, um, and use that often to reference um, the work done in the UK, particularly um, looking at the return on investment and issues about whether a pH is better than an X-ray. And the fact that sometimes x-rays are actually misread. And that data, a lot of it does come from the National Health Service. There are also other publications um, that have been come out in the last three or four years questioning the accuracy of ng-tube um, of, of x-rays for verification of NG tubes. The Patient Safety Movement Foundation has a work group on this very topic, and much of that work can be um, attributed back to um, Deanna. Again, she approached that group, I think working with your group, actually, um, and uh, they elected to take that on as a topic. And that uh, work group is co-chaired by Deanna and I, and we fashioned most of the um, action plan of our um, actionable patient safety solution after work done by the UK and published um, by the National Health Service. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, that, that, that's good to know. And um, it's an interesting one. Um, oh, my cat is trying to join us. Um, so, um, <laughs> You know, I, I think um, we we talk a lot in the UK about um, patients and carers' voices being heard, but I think it's enormously encouraging that you and Diana co-chair that group. And how do you think um, having that that patient, family, carer voice in has influenced the debate uh, and helped um, change be progressed? Well, I, um, I would let Deanna answer this as well, but I, I would just say that she is probably the person that keeps us grounded. Um, for example, this study that we just completed and we're mining the data, there were questions on that, how we were going to um, look at that data, because in our specific games, it was going to be by hospital individual hospital, but we had, I think, 174 hospitals, children's hospitals, answer the survey, but 252 nurses. So obviously there's overlap and there are a number of different answers um, from, you know, about six or seven hospitals. So the question was, do we throw out those answers? How do we throw those out? And um, so I actually am going to kind of refer uh, to or defer to Diana to kind of go through that discussion because she she can kind of tell you how she contributes to the group by this example. So, Diana. So, as Beth said, you know the data was more um, more nurses from um, hospitals, different units responded mm -hmm. to the survey, and um, when we were talking about you know should we not can you know count those contributions and i voiced that you know in my research and things that i have come across um outside of the novel group that i had learned that um even though a hospital may have um, a procedure 
that doesn't mean that same procedure is utilized throughout their different units and mm -hmm. gave example of a hospital in particular that I had found that they have different procedures for the different units and, you know, and fought, um, you know, that we need to count those different voices of the units um, with our data mining because it will show that there's even, you know, that even though we're making an impact at the hospitals, that, you know, unit wide, we also need to have that same impact and make sure that hospitals have the same procedure throughout their organization and not cater to different um, units because that safety protocol that we're fighting so valiantly for needs to be universal in an organization and not individualized. And so I, I push for that and they are doing the data mining to look into that um, and agreed that, yeah, you know, as we have found, there are units that do things differently and we should look at those different voices so that we yeah. can know how do we cater our surveys in the future and how do we cater our message that we're, you know, that we're doing as a novel project so that we can hit all those different types of topics and those different reasons why hospitals, you know, currently do have different methodology on units so that we can find out what else do we need to do to improve our message so that they can get to have the same procedure throughout their organization. Yeah, yeah. One, one I, of the things I, I, I would um, is that the novel project is a different group than I've ever been involved with and a different group than Aspen has ever done, um, although they're doing it now with the adult novel. And that is we are a group of representatives of organizations. So we have a parent representative, but we have a representative from critical care nurses, NICU nurses, um, home care. Um, uh, we have a physician from Canada on the group. We have a nurse that's from Brazil that has an, um, kind of worked with our NICU uh, sub work group. We have um, people that um, are faculty. They are um, clinicians, um, PhD nurses, master's nurses, all kinds of people. Um, and that is our value. Each one of us represents another group and hopefully is impacting practice by that membership involvement, like the Society mm. of Pediatric Nurses, their president-elect is on our group. Mm. Mm. True. I, I, I think probably that's why you've been able to have as much impact as you have. Um, you've got so. such a broad skill set and range of interests, but it, I think it was really interesting to hear <clears throat> the, the specific impact that having a parent representative on, um, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Diana has made a huge, huge contribution there. Um, just, um, <clears throat> I'm conscious of time. What struck me when I started thinking about this is <clears throat> you're trying to change practice across the whole of the USA. Um, that's a population of about 320 million people across 52 states and for me, um, in the UK, sometimes we look at maps and we kind of go 52 states. We think of them as like counties, but actually one of your states is like England. Um, so, you yeah. know, <clears throat> actually, some of your states are much bigger than England, um, geographically at least. You know, we, we have 66 million people in four countries or, or states, um, and um, <clears throat> we still have never events related to uh, nasogastric tube misplacement. So when you set off on this, um, how do you even start changing practice on the scale you have to deal with? Um, and what have you learned that might be useful for others who want to change practice in an area like patient safety? Well, uh, what we, I think, have decided is that having organization representation gives us the advantage of access to those members. And so we look at this practice change as a top-down effort where administrators and hospital, higher 
up um, people in hospitals need to dictate the, the practice change, but the clinicians need to buy in. So we need to change one institution at a time. And each clinician, just as Deanna said, I mean, the whole issue of her saying, what about individual nursing units is so key. We cannot be having practice changes within different institutions and different um, units. So um, we are trying to um, change practice by taking research that other people have done because we have done some research, but we are not a research engine. We are a change agent. And so take research that other people have done, define the standard practice. And we have done that. We, pra we published a best practice document at the end of 2019 or in 2019 rather, and then disseminate that information to every group we can think of that would do it. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. People that want to make global practice changes need to be involved with global groups. And so um, we have members from all over the world. We have where Deanna and I are involved in the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, which is a wonderful group. Um, yeah, I encourage anyone listening to Google that group and look at what they're doing um, and, and just not give up because yeah. um, no parent should be telling a story like we just heard. Yeah. I want to yeah. add on to what Beth said. So for me, anyone that is willing to let me speak about my story and share my story, I do so. So I thank you for allowing me to share my story. Um, but I also, um, I go very grassroots. I, um, I share my story to actual nursing students um, in the, um, in my state, I go and, um, volunteer my time. And I figure if I get nursing students at the ground up, um, I can plant that seed and get them to think differently. And, um, you know, to remember how important a parent voice is, as I remind them, you're a visitor in our life during the worst time of our life yeah. and that you have the medical experience but we have the personal experience and together we have to join to be able to do that holistic care for, you know, our, our person that is, you know, getting treatment. And, um, and so that, you know, by banding together, we can make a team to make a change in the health outcome. I also, um, you know, any organization that will let me speak, um, you know, uh, when I met, um, you know, Stephen with NG pod, he was actually showing his product to the hospital that my son passed away at. And, um, and I remember, um, you know, sharing my story with him and that it just, um, it resonated with him. And so he stayed in touch with me for several years before we actually met. And then, um, he opened the door to like what Beth said, you know, are getting involved with the patient safety movement foundation. Um, and, you know, opened that door and allowed me to work with that network. And so, and then I also, I, I admit it, I go out and I Google hospitals and I look to see what they have online for their NG practice. And if they have something I don't agree with, I contact them. And I have cold called hospitals. And I, there was one hospital in particular that I found that they had an outdated video where they were sending families home doing the auscultation, not even aspirate. It was just auscultation and contacted them and um, told them my story. They immediately took that video down. And I'm happy to say that that hospital is slowly implementing the changes that Beth and, um, and our group do with the novel project um, so that they can have better practices. So I go anywhere that I can just touching how can I connect how can I get my voice heard how can I you know have the novel project and the patient safety movement foundation and, and anybody that is willing to make change in ng2 placement yeah and, and I guess that goes back to what Beth said don't give up and uh, and and again I think it's so important to have that 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 parent voice that experienced voice because Sometimes as healthcare professionals, we're we're far too polite to each other, uh, and 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 we and we should we should do a bit more of that cold calling and calling stuff out a little bit quicker. I think so. Uh, well, well done you for reminding uh, healthcare professionals that um, 
we have a duty to push hard as well and not not sit on stuff. Well, I have to say, talking about Stephen, Deanna, he talks about you all the time. Um, you you are you are a real touchstone for this organisation. Um, you know, he will say to anyone who will listen, um, you know, we're doing what we do because nobody should uh, die or be injured from being fed, uh, from having food. Uh, and it, it is a real, um, you know, your, your story is, is a touchstone for us and, and what sometimes keeps us going when, you know, in the commercial world, you can, you can get a bit bogged down in uh, stuff that doesn't really matter that much. So um, we often reflect on your story. Uh, and, and what you've done um, uh, since since Grant's death. So so, so thank you for being um, our inspiration when we sometimes need it, uh, as well as you know an inspiration for the for the novel group. Look, I I could talk to you guys all day, but uh, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for coming on the NG podcast and for sharing your experience of uh, nasogastric tube safety and changing practice. From a US perspective, um, you know it, it's been it's been great to speak to you. Um, it's only eight days till your presidential election now, and um, I think exactly a month till Thanksgiving. <clears throat> I know which will be the most joyous of those, um, <laughs> but I, I do I do hope both of those go well for you, um, and I really hope that you know when we've all made more progress with COVID nineteen that. Um, we can we can meet together in person, but um, thank you again that. so much for coming. Yeah, come back over and see us. Um, oh, I would do it in a heartbeat, right, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're all, all a bit locked down at the moment. It's not much fun. Wait until we um, open up, oh. again, you know. Uh, so you know, c- come and see yeah. us. It would be a joy to spend some some uh, some more time with you. And uh, good luck um, with. Uh, the novel project and uh, and the Thank patient you. safety movement in the states yeah. Thank you very much. and and um, you know um, keep in touch keep in touch yes yeah. definitely and thank you for everything that ng pod is doing it's yes. it has a special place thank for you me. thank you thank you we we hope to bring it to the states very soon thank We hope you enjoy this episode, and if you do, please subscribe or like on whichever platform you're either viewing or listening to this on.